Hi, everyone. We are going to begin here in just a minute. Um, this is Deesa Simpson from NextPoint, and we are excited to get started about our remote collection and review of digital evidence. But we won't start for one more minute, so thanks for joining early. We are at the hour and I'm just going to give a couple more seconds to get everybody uh, logged in and ask, you know, everybody to thank you for coming early. And if you do have any questions, we will be answering them at the end of the webinar. But thank you for joining Remote Collection and Review of Modern Digital Evidence. We're going to get started here in just a couple seconds, but I want everybody to be able to log in before we begin. Today we're going to be talking about understanding modern e-discovery in the age of digital communication. So we are really excited about this webinar. In fact, um, I think it might be our highest attendance and you guys are certainly early. So we're gonna jump right in. Today presenting, we have Sonali Ray and Phil Knox. Sonali Ray is from NextPoint and Phil Knox is from For Discovery. Let's learn a little bit more about them. So Sonali Ray is our Director of Legal Strategy here at NextPoint. She earned her Mechanical of Engineering degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's a licensed patent attorney before the USPTO. Her principal focus is on ESI protocol and consultation. She works often with artificial intelligence as applied to e-discovery, and she is certainly one of the top women in e-discovery that I have had the privilege of working with. Then we're also going to hear from Phil Knox. Phil Knox is the Director of Business Development in For Discovery. He has over two decades of experience in the legal tech field, and his focus is on advertising clients on CloudPlex litigation matters, project strategy, and business development. He works with clients to put together business-to-business -to -business vendor contracts and professional service agreements in place. He previously managed information technology for a global law firm. So these are two amazing experts in the e-discovery area, and they are going to dive right in into remote collections. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Sonali, and she's going to cover what we're going to do today. Thank you. Um, so hello everyone, as Deesa just mentioned, my name is Sonali Ray, and I wanted to first run through what exactly we're actually covering today. Um, one of the things that you'll probably realize is missing from our conversation, um, or we'll touch on very lightly, is email. Um, I think that we kind of wanted to take the focus on um, collections and sources that kind of go beyond your standard practice. And I know that email is kind of tried and true. There's a lot of legalisms right around that, and they have made it pretty simple to kind of self-collect from inboxes these days. So we do kind of want to delve into this a little bit further. So we'll first talk about that modern world forms of data sources, and we'll kind of delve into all of the different types of sources that may come into play for your cases. Then we'll talk about some of the best practices involved with remote collection. Um, the word remote, I feel like, is something that can kind of resonate with pretty much everyone, especially in the world of COVID-19. So we really kind of want to enhance and emphasize that remote element to your collection practices. Um, we also want to talk about some of the case law that surrounds these various forms of electronic communication. Um, I think it's always important to know what's going on in the courts and making sure that you're kind of always compliant with those aspects in terms of data preservation, data handling, and also that collection source. Um, and then we'll kind of talk through some case studies. I think it always helps to have a little bit of added context in terms of all of these topics. I think that a lot of this can get very in the weeds when it comes to the technology and the terms involved. So I think that context can always help um, pull you away a little bit from that. And then finally, we'll get into some question and answer. So if you guys have questions, feel free to write in throughout the course of the entire presentation. And at the end, we'll try and get to as many of those as we can. 
Okay, well, this is Phil Knox from Ford Discovery. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, to start off the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about where is the data. You know, obviously, a big part of the collection process is determining where relevant data resides, and knowing the potential locations of data can be very valuable when planning your collection and performing your custodial interviews. So what I'm gonna do here is identify the most common data locations, summarize what type of data is found in each, and then go over the level of effort involved with collecting from each source. So this particular slide, I started with Ford Discovery eight years ago, and the three sources here, computers, emails, and file shares, were definitely the, made up the vast majority of the collections we were doing. Um, you know, on the next slide, we'll see that there's quite a few different locations now that we've looked, but I'm going to start out with these three locations. So first of all, you have computers. You know, computers, we're talking about a desktop PC, a Mac lap book. Uh, obviously, on these, you can find a data repository, a lot of you know, PDFs, Word files, communications. The effort involved in collecting from computers is typically medium. You do need some user intervention on these, um, you know, if it's a, especially if it's a remote collection, which we'll get into. Secondly, we'll touch very briefly on emails. For business-related matters, emails are still the primary form of communication. Uh, but like Sonali said, they are relatively easy to collect. Really just need a username and password for the accounts. You do need to want to check to see if two-factor authentication is enabled. Uh, if you're not sure what that is, you know, think of when you log into a bank site, you know, your email account, and you get challenged. It'll send you a, you know, a text message with a code you have to enter in. So if that is the case with an email account, you will need to be in contact with the custodian at the time of the collection for them to relay that code to you. Uh, but typically, the effort level for emails is relatively easy. That'll take us to file shares. File shares are, are traditionally data that's stored on corporate servers. Two main types are personal shares, you know, a lot of times referred to as home directories, H drives. This is data that's stored up on a corporate server, but it's only accessible to a single user. And then there's company-wide shares, which can be the entire company, departments, you know, the sales, the marketing, R&D department. Um, they're more common. File shares uh, can range from anywhere from medium to easy to collect. It depends on where the servers are. A lot of companies do still have an internal server room. Uh, you're going to need to coordinate with IP in that instance to see how to get access to those servers. However, a lot of this data now is up in the cloud, which we're going to talk about in a little while, which, which makes the remote collection and, quite frankly, collections in general much easier. Here's some of the newer forms of where data is located. Now, first, we're gonna talk about smartphones and tablets, um, primarily smartphones. Uh, smartphones are a treasure trove of data uh, these days. You know, think about it in terms of you know, a computer you might sit in front of for eight hours a day. Uh, a smartphone is 24 uh, seven. So there's a lot more date, potential data on there. Um, you know, anything from communications and text messages, you know, down to application data. Uh, you know, specifically, let's say in a personal injury case, we've worked on a few of those where people wanted to know what the individual is doing at the time of the accident. We've seen where uh, one case where a user was flipping through songs on the Pandora app, another time where he was taking selfies of himself with mirrored sunglasses on, which was actually kind of creepy because you could see the what he was going to collide into in his mirrored sunglasses. So there's a lot on there. Um, the collection of smartphones can get, uh, the, the effort level can be difficult. Number one, custodians don't like to be without their smartphones. So you have to negotiate through that. We do, based on the type of smartphone it is, the collection method might differ a little bit. Um, and you do need some you know, physical access to it, whether it be sending a remote collection kit out or physically, uh, you know, being in having the phone itself. Social media. Uh, so 
social media can be valuable as well, uh, particularly from a pre-investigation standpoint. Um, you know, data that's going to be on social media, photos, uh, you know, posts, comments. We're going to talk in depth about social media a little bit later. Uh, the effort level, the effort level for social media, quite frankly, can go anywhere from hard to easy, depending on what you need to collect. Then we have messaging tools. Messaging tools, we're talking about applications like Slack. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Slack. Slack is a, a very popular intra-office messaging tool. People use to send instant messages to each other within a company. Additionally, there's products like WhatsApp um, that are third-party messaging apps outside of you know, the, the inherent text messaging app on, a, on an iPhone or Android device. Again, the, we're going to talk specifically about messaging tools later on in the presentation, and the difficulty in collecting can vary based on what you're doing. And then finally, we have cloud sources. Now, cloud sources here is kind of a catch-all. Messaging tools, social media, quite frankly, file shares, a lot of this could fall under the heading of cloud sources. So the next slide, we've dedicated an entire slide to cloud sources. So these are example of cloud sources, but before I go through them, I want to take a step back and uh, what is the cloud? Um, you know, people seem to think it's or some it's some magical storage space out there, um, but the reality of it is actually pretty simple. All the cloud really is is it's computers that are connected to the internet and someone else is controlling them, um, and you are either registering. Uh, with that company that's hosting, or you're paying them, oftentimes both. So here's a few examples of cloud sources that are out there that you can find relevant data. Um, starting again in the middle there, see Office 365 and G Suite. That's uh, Microsoft and Google's offerings that essentially take over your server room. Uh, all your email, your file shares uh, are hosted by the companies up in the cloud rather than in a traditional storage or a server room in a company. You know, particularly small and medium companies, it's very common. In fact, I would say the majority of them now have this set up. Makes perfect sense. You know, if you're an architectural firm of 15 people, you don't want to manage your own internal server room. So, you know, you pay Microsoft or Google to host it. Now, the good news with these, it's actually relatively easy to collect because it's connected to the internet. All you really need is you work with the administrator of either one of those environments. They can create you a temporary account with administrative privileges, and you just need to know where to go to collect. So those are, if you find out someone's using Office 365 or G Suite from a collection standpoint, that's typically good news because the effort level is, is relatively low to get data from them. Now, if we go to Dropbox, Dropbox is similar, although it's more used on a personal basis. So you'll see individual users, Dropbox is a cloud location to store files. It's used by corporations also, uh, but it's more for a sharing with other entities. So a company will put files up on Dropbox, make it accessible to another company or individual where they can go and get those files. Getting up to Dropbox or getting files from Dropbox, again, pretty simple, username, password, maybe two-factor authentication enabled but it's relatively easy to get data from Dropbox. Now, there are some social media examples here like Twitter and Facebook. We'll get to those later. Just wanted to talk quickly about Salesforce. Salesforce is an online platform. Uh, it's a CRM system, which basically means salespeople, marketing. They utilize this to track their contacts, their communication with their contacts, deal status. Now, Salesforce is a database, so the way the data is stored is a little different. You can't just go up there and collect everything like you could with a folder in Office 365. So in a situation like Salesforce, we really recommend using Salesforce uh, reporting tools and search tools, running reports, pulling the data out that way. That's the easiest and most efficient way to do it, and it is defensible. The same concept holds true for QuickBooks. QuickBooks is an online accounting system. Again, it's in a database format, and you're going to want to run reports with that. So if we could next slide. 
So Sonali in her intro talked about remote collections. Um, remote collections now, the trend is going significantly upward and collections being done remotely. Uh, you know, the obvious reason is the whole COVID-19 pandemic. You can't send people, well, you don't want to, and oftentimes you can't send people on site to perform collections. So the alternate is doing a remote collection. Now, email, social media, cloud services, those are inherently uh, remote collections regardless. That's the only way you collect them. This process here details phones, smartphones, and PCs. So the first step involved, and this is, you're gonna have to go through this exercise no matter where the data is, is to identify the data to be collected. You know, why are you collecting this? Where is it? Um, you know, are you looking for documents? Are you looking for communications? And then once you figure that out, determine where the data is located. And the more specific you can be here, particularly in a remote collection standpoint, uh, the better. For instance, if it's a phone, is it an iPhone? Is it an Android? This is going to be, this is going to matter because the type of cable that's sent on the remote collection kit is dependent on the type of phone. Also, if it's a, P, if it's a computer, is it a Windows box or is it a Mac? Again, different tools are used to collect from each device. So then once all that is determined, put together something called a remote collection kit. Simply put, the, it differs if it's a phone or a computer. If it's a computer, literally what it is, it's a USB drive with remote access software and forensic collection tools. And in the case of a, uh, a cell phone or a, a smartphone, it's a laptop along with the cable to connect the phone to the laptop. That's built out, it's put in a FedEx box, sent out to the custodian. When it arrives at the custodian, there are instructions, very easy to follow instructions, just a few steps uh, that the custodian has to follow. Uh, one of our technicians will be on the phone to walk them through the process. It's really straightforward. They just have to, you know, in the case of a, a laptop, they just need to plug the USB drive into it, start up the remote connection software, give us the code, we take it from there. On the phone, or on, on the phone, they just need to plug it into the laptop, uh, connect it to their Wi-Fi, and we can take it from there. And from there, the actual collection takes place. This is done in a forensically sound, defensible manner. All the data is verified post-collection. And it, we collect back to the USB drive, with the computer and with the uh, laptop, we just collect back to the laptop. Once it's finished, we let the custodian know, they put it back in the FedEx box, there's a return label and send it back to us. So I wanna talk specifically about mobile devices and the mobile device collection. So the steps here are, mainly relevant whether you're doing an in-person collection or a remote collection, but they're important points to keep in mind. First thing is cell phone data is very volatile. You wanna collect this data as soon as possible. For instance, on an iPhone, if you delete a text message on an iPhone, unless there's a backup in place, you literally have potentially minutes to maybe an hour to recover that before it becomes fully unrecoverable. Also, there's other ways that data could go away uh, example I like to use, this was a criminal case a few years back. Uh, it was a drug dealer that was arrested. He was a brilliant guy and he had a bunch of photos on his phone of him posing with his money and big piles of drugs, which obviously would have been pretty compelling evidence in this matter. So they took the gentleman back to the police department, put his phone in the detective, a drawer in a detective's desk, brought him to the interrogation room, got his one phone call, didn't call his attorney, he called a buddy that had his iCloud credentials. So while he was being interrogated, the buddy wiped out his phone entirely and it was not recoverable. So they lost all that valuable, uh, that valuable data. So if you know you need to collect a cell phone, get on it. Do it as soon as you possibly can. Also creating a protocol to dictate the collection. Again, people don't like having their phones collected. Um, you know, there's a lot of private data on there, you know, whether it be communications with their kids or friends, you know, don't even get me started on what you find in photos. So, you know, the standard operating procedure is here. We collect the entire phone, 
encrypt it, put it back in our data vault here. And then based on the requirements, we'll do searches, pull certain data out and only deliver that data to the parties. However, we do run into some situations where the custodian absolutely will not let his entire, the image of his entire phone leave his premises. In that case, we do, and we'll write a protocol to dictate this, but in that case, we can collect to the laptop, work on the laptop, pull the data out of it. The entire image we can either delete, which we don't recommend, or we can copy it to a thumb drive right there in his presence and encrypt it and let them keep it and only give them the password. So worst case, if we ever need to go back to it, we have it, yet that custodian, he or she is the only one in control of it. Now you gotta be specific what you're looking for, what data do you need, this becomes, very important because there are times you can't get everything off the phone. Great example is email on an iPhone. If you're using the native mail app, which is what most people use on an iPhone for email, that's all encrypted. You're not going to get that data from the cell phone collection itself. You need to also get the Gmail or Yahoo credentials and collect from the cloud. Also, always if, if there's data missing that's been since deleted, Always ask if there's an iCloud backup. You may be able to get it from there. iTunes backup, just ask if they plug a phone into a computer. If it has iTunes installed on it, there's a chance it made an automatic automatic backup. Ask for that computer. Uh, you know, We found backups that were a year old and there were text messages on that backup that were not on the phone itself that were relevant. And then you know, makes, this one's really important, quite frankly. Make sure the custodian understands how long they're going to be without their phone. Uh, people get, custodians get really cranky just giving it up in the first place. If you have to give a realistic timeline of how long this is going to take to be without their phone. My answer there is it depends. It can take anywhere from one to six hours to image a phone typically. Depends on what we're imaging, how big the phone is. But when we have these specs on the phone, we can typically get it down to about a two hour range. So they know what to expect. So one of the case law that I wanted to kind of talk through was this Kick Sports case. And for anyone that's not familiar with this case, um, a client of ours actually brought it to my attention. And I have really been, I feel like, passing around this case because not only does it provide a lot of context in terms of data preservation and some of the topics that we're talking about here today, but it also kind of talks about a lot more in terms of e-discovery just as a whole. So I would really recommend kind of reading through this case as a whole um, at some point in time if you know e-discovery is something that you want to kind of familiarize yourself with in terms of the case law surrounding it. Um, but the, the portion that I wanted to talk about here today was more so that mobile device element to this case. So in this case, this was a trade secret matter and Kicksports um, is a company that's in the business of basically selling types of soccer products. Um, two members of this company had left the company and basically created a competing business, which gave rise to the market or gave rise to the lawsuit. Um, in the course of the exchange of information, um, the opposing party had asserted that there wasn't enough communications that had been produced. So they had entered into a motion to compel to request additional emails and text messages to be produced. Kickforts um, opposed this motion, saying that they were basically not technologically savvy enough to have these types of quote unquote mass communications. Um, and everything that needed to be produced had already been done so. The courts ultimately basically did not buy this. They said that it was difficult to believe that they were operating a multi-million dollar business in 2018 without communicating via technology. So essentially, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, the courts had actually decided that Forensic experts would be employed to basically go through the different sources that were being asked, but Kicksports would only have to bear the burden of the costs involved if something responsive was actually found amongst that newly collected information. So once all of that information was collected, it did reveal that the Kicksports not only had in their possession hundreds of relevant messages, but they further had deleted communications that were extremely relevant to the matter um, and actually got into the form of 
Not only did they bear the burden of all of the expense involved for the collection, but they were also sanctioned under Rule 37 for spoliation due to the intentional deleted material. So this is a perfect use case in the situation that not only did they not do their due diligence in what needed to be collected and what should be considered in the scope of discovery, but on top of that, um, you know, the level of preservation, whether or not that was intentional, um, in this particular situation, it obviously was because that's how the courts deemed it to be. But in other situations, it could be unintentional where things get deleted. And as Phil mentioned, especially when it comes to mobile data, um, that is really volatile. So the earlier, the better when it comes to those collections. And if you think there's even a sheer possibility that it might come into scope, I always think it's great to kind of have that preservation and just have that full encrypted image of that cell phone just in hand. And again, that's not in a usable format. It's more so just this encrypted package that you can ever that you can turn to if that should arise. So it's just kind of doing your due diligence and making sure you avoid situations such as this. So um, another use case that we kind of wanted to talk through, and this goes beyond just the case law surrounding, but this was something that we internally kind of had gone through with one of our clients, was they were working with extremely, extremely tight time constraints when it came to the collection and the production of their data and their information. Um, at kind of the last second of the cell phone came into the mix, and we ended up having to collect directly from the cloud because there was no availability for the actual device to be accessed itself. So even though it was not in kind of the recommended format, we were able to get what was needed from that cloud-based backup. And we, were ex we exported all of that information out into a spreadsheet and they knew exactly what they were looking for. So in this particular situation, not only were there time constraints, but they also had a very pinpointed and targeted approach that they were able to kind of do and only produce the sections that were necessary for that targeted element. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, a lot of the times that I feel like I always get the question, well, once this is collected, how is this, what format does it come out in? Or how do I view it? Or how do I kind of go through this? There's a couple different options that are available to you. And I kind of wanted to run through some of the top two that we see um, most in hand. So that top little snippet, and sorry, these are kind of small because we were trying to fit them all on one slide, but that top little snippet of a spreadsheet indicates kind of the most, um, I would say cost effective and probably the least time intensive in a deliverable from an actual mobile device collection. So all of that information, especially that text message information, can be put out into a spreadsheet format. Down below, you have what we call kind of that image format or the bubble format. That's basically how you view your text messages right on your phone as you know when you're actually looking at the device. Now, I understand that that obviously is a little, most people lean towards that because that's a little bit more user friendly. It's a little bit more visually appealing. However, it is more expensive and it takes more time to kind of image out all of those messages like this. If you think about the number of text messages that you send daily or weekly, I mean, that really adds up to a lot of messages and most of that is not going to be relevant to your case. So what I always kind of suggest to our clients is a hybrid approach between the two. So when you get everything out in just one massive spreadsheet, it's not super usable um, unless you know exactly what you're looking for. However, if you ask for that final spreadsheet to be broken up by conversation, sometimes that can be a tabbed approach or separate spreadsheets per conversation, and then further color coded on a line item for outgoing versus incoming messages, you not only get all of the metadata that surrounds every message, so you get the exact timestamp, you get the device, and any other additional information that might suffice for that you know, particular message. But you also are able to kind of follow along with that message structure the same way that you would in that image format, because you, know, you get the outgoing in the green, the incoming in the white. Um, you kind of are able to follow along in a spreadsheet format the same way. So it kind of allows you for a hybrid approach of not only cost efficiency, but also the time management of that final product post collection. Um, and it, it also kind of 
emphasizes that usability in that final product as well. So my personal opinion and my personal recommendation is to kind of ask for that hybrid approach, but you do want have some you know different options available to you. So the next thing we kind of wanted to talk through are um, instant messaging. So we kind of found this stat, which I thought was funny. I honestly thought the number was going to be higher, but 50% of instant messenger users have sent or received legally harmful information. So you can imagine how much this is kind of starting to get into our daily and commonplace when it comes to entering the scope of discovery information. Okay, so instant messaging can be a variable, very valuable source of data. However, there are challenges involved with, and that's you know why I mentioned that the effort in collecting can go anywhere from hard down to easy. I'm just going to go through a few examples of some of the issues involved with messaging. So first of all, let's you have an I, iPhone, and on the iPhone you're collecting the text messages. Now, text messages between iPhone users, they're sent in a format called iMessage. Um, it actually goes through Apple, not really through your phone carrier, like your SMS if you're sending to an Android user or going Android to Android. Now on iPhones, there's a feature on there, iMessage for iCloud enabled. Uh, from a user standpoint, you don't notice any difference, but the messages are actually stored in the cloud, not on your phone itself. Your phone just acts as a, you know, basically a, a monitor, but the data itself is up on the cloud. It, the point of it is it reduces space on your phone, but the problem is if you collect the phone and you want to get those text messages, they're not going to exist on the phone. So you have one of two options in that case. You can either get the iCloud credentials and collect from iCloud, or pre-collection, you can turn that functionality off and let the messages sync back to the phone itself. Next issue is if you're some of the third party messaging apps, I'm talking about like WhatsApp, Telegram, there's a lot of them out there right now, but the backups might not exist in iCloud or with all the rest of the data that's backed up on the phone, meaning that just getting iCloud credentials to get to it isn't going to help. You're going to need to get the credentials for the specific app to pull it off the cloud. Again, this is data that's not necessarily going to be on the phone itself, but you do want to collect it. So again, I'm the reason I'm saying I'm stressing the data can exist in many places. That's why it's important to figure out pre-collection, what exactly you're looking for, and then work with your experts to figure out where that data might actually be. Uh, there's some less common third-party apps that can get a little more challenging to get to the data. The forensic tools that we use will automatically parse the data in the more common apps. Again, you know, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, I'll use the Telegram example again. That means that we can easily pull the messages out of it just inherently using you know, our tools. However, some, some more of the, uh, the more obscure apps that aren't used all that often, uh, you can't use those tools. And you're going to have to have a forensic expert actually go in and basically reverse code the database to get to the data. So you need to, how badly do you actually need that data? Because it can get expensive and time consuming to actually do that process. Um, some of the data is encrypted. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of these messaging apps do have encrypted data, the text messages. So encryption isn't the, you know, it's not, you're not hitting a brick wall. Sometimes you can't get to it, but that's also gonna involve some additional effort. You know, like for instance, on Android phones, we typically can find the export key uh, to apply to the encryption and get the data out of it. We can find passwords, we can get passwords from the user, but it's another thing to look out for. And then also some various tools have no formal registration process. So, you know, people can be using these anonymously and it's very hard to, you know, figure out who's actually using it and, and you know, where the data is coming from. So you want to go to, oh, there we go. 
Um, all right, perfect. So the next thing we want to kind of talk about is there, I had some trouble finding specific cases surrounding instant messaging. Um, I do feel like this is a little bit of a newer area. Um, so there isn't a ton in terms of that, but I did actually find some case law that kind of surrounded, um, or some legalisms that kind of surrounded the things that you might want to look out for in terms of instant messaging and the scope of discovery. So before you decide to actually monitor an employee's instant message, um, you want to make sure that you're definitely considering the Federal Electronic Communications Act to make sure you're not going into any sort of privacy law violations. Um, that is something that's important and it's also extra important if you do work with international clientele um, or you have international employees or you even have just data stored internationally. Um, that is something that you want to kind of fully delve into, including the GDPR. Um, according to original federal rules, instant messaging was typically not stored in a medium that was conducive for retrieval and examination. Therefore, it was outside of the scope of discoverable data. It is important to know that this has changed since the amended federal rules. So this is now can very much so come into the scope of that discovery. And so I think it is really important to kind of be looking through some of those challenges and those points that Phil just made earlier as well. Um, I think it's also important to know the proportionality levels on this. Um, I know that proportionality has just kind of been a hot button topic in terms of e-discovery as a whole, because as technology continues to grow, that scope of discovery has been growing exponentially. And so I think it is really important to kind of weigh that proportionality element to this. Um, the SEC, as well as the NASD, have created some rules that basically put in a three-year retention requirement on instant messaging. So that is important to know. This is not an indefinite time period. Um, if that, if the scope of your actual case goes beyond maybe a three-year mark and for everything else that you're collecting, it is going beyond that three-year mark, that might not necessarily be the case for instant messaging. Um, so I think it is important to kind of know that even though instant messaging is coming into the scope of discovery, it is still more so on a targeted manner. Um, also, if you encounter a situation where you are having to record and save those exchanges, it's important to consider that comprehensive retention policy, um, making sure that you have business records of how things are being archived and why and kind of the full scope as to the process being taken around that. Um, I think it's also great to have that secure and effective data authentication system. So whenever that collection time may come, you're ensuring that everything is kind of in that time stamped forensically sound manner to make sure that it is actually information that's being able to be admitted into evidence. Um, there's nothing worse than going through all of these steps to kind of get that final product and then not even being able to enter it in as evidence just based on an authentication issue. Um, so I think it's really important, especially when it comes to instant messaging and some of these kind of non-conventional collection sources um, to make sure that you're kind of taking some of those additional steps that you may not for maybe your standard um, email collection, just because you know there is a little bit more nuance involved with some of these sources. So I think it's good to kind of stay ahead of it. Okay, let's talk about Slack specifically. So I touched on it a little bit earlier, but Slack is typically a product used by companies for intra-office communication, sending messages to each other, you know, attachments. Um, particularly, we see a lot in younger organizations where it pretty much has replaced email for intra-office communications. Um, you know, I've learned particularly younger generation, I have a 16 year old daughter and she's a smart kid, but she barely even knows how to use email. I had to help her with an email. Uh, she was trying to send to set up an interview for a job. So it's particularly the, the, the younger segment tends to gravitate more towards the instant messaging side of things for communications. So Slack specifically, so the types of data you're gonna find in Slack, um, First of all, there's direct conversations. That's just a one-to-one -one message, just like a text message, essentially. There's also group conversations. 
you know, same concept, it's a message, but there can be, you know, anywhere from three plus members in that conversation. Within Slack, you can also set up channels. Channels are constant, uh, you know, chats that are set up. So you can set up a R&D channel, you can set up a marketing channel, and any time that a message is posted to that channel, you know, that entire group is notified and can respond. And then finally, one of the, the features of Slack that's nice is you can, there's third party integration. So you can integrate directly into Google Docs and you know, a whole bunch of uh, additional uh, third party apps uh, to make it a more encompassing uh, experience. But you have to keep those in mind too. You need to get the data that these are linking to as part of the collection. Now, one of the biggest things you need to determine when you're collecting from Slack and you will, we, we're seeing a lot of it now, um, is what version are they using? So are they using a free version or are they using a paid version? If they're using the free version of Slack, it, collection gets a little more difficult. Uh, you, you can use an admin account, but you can only collect from channels, not from you know, direct or group conversations. In order to collect those, you're gonna, you need to get the individuals or the users' credentials to collect there. Now, once you get into the paid realm, there's different tiers. There's Standard Plus and Enterprise Grid. Standard and Plus both give you the full, you know, the admin credentials to go through and you can collect from anything. There's no restrictions there. However, the delivery format gets a little tricky and I'll talk about that in a second. Enterprise Grid, you get the full admin functionality again, but there's also an API plugin and that means there's an interface within Slack that you can plug in products to export data into a more usable format. So from a delivery format standpoint, the default format that it comes in is something called a JSON file. JSON files are great for containing data. They're very difficult to get data out of. So if you collect this JSON file, you're gonna have to use a firm like you know, even ourselves to go in and actually get the data out and then be able to host it on a platform like NextPoint. Um, you know, it's doable, but it is a little trickier, but if your client, that's all your client has, that's what you have to go with. Now, Enterprise Grid, there are plugins and applications that can plug straight into it and pull the data out in a more usable, easier fashion. You know, you can get to it a lot easier and, you know, put it into delivery or into a, uh, a review platform much easier. So now segueing over into social media. So this is kind of that last topic that we wanted to walk, wanted to talk about. Um, in this, we actually found quite a few stat, stats that were pretty alarming. I mean, I feel like I personally am definitely an avid social media user, but knowing that there's over 3 billion active social media users worldwide, um, that's a pretty, I mean, that's in, very, very high. Um, and 90% of those social media users are interacting with brands and retailers. 77% um, in the United States own at least one social media profile. 135 minutes are being spent on um, an everyday basis. And YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat are the most popular when it comes to those platforms among teens. Um, so this is something that's really not going away and there's just consistently new sources of social media. So I think it is really important to talk about. So here's some challenges and best practices for social media. So you know, what is social media? I mean, we've talked about it. You know, of course, it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, you know, TikTok. Uh, you'll, you've heard of that if you're a teenager or if you have teenagers. Um, what if, what data is available? I mean, anything again. Uh, communication between people, postings, uh, personal information, videos, photos. Um, there's a lot that you can find on social media. But from a best practices standpoint, we have to differentiate between do you have public access or private access to this account? Differentiation here is public is, if I'm signed into Facebook, but I'm not friends with someone, it's the data I can see like that. Private data is either I'm friends with them or I have their credentials to log in as them. It's what data I can see that way. Now, if you only have public uh, 
you know, public access, we typically recommend just doing kind of an eyeball through it before even collecting. See if there's something there that you actually need. For instance, if, you, if you're working on a disability case and you see a picture of the person claiming disability down in Florida holding a marlin, uh, you might want to utilize that to compel the court to give you, to have them turn over their credentials to you. Um, when, if you do get at, and you can just, you know, save that photo if necessary. So once you get private access, the vast majority of social media platforms now have something called profile downloads. Profile downloads can be done, you know, by anyone, quite frankly. You just go in, there's a, it's within some menu, depending on the platform. And for Facebook, for instance, you go in, you request it, sends you a link, and the amount of data you get does vary, but it's getting more and more. Facebook, for instance, if you do a profile download, you get everything, you get all the photos, all the posts, you get things, you know, when you last logged in and what IP address you logged in from. So you can get a lot of data that way. Um, you know, some of the challenges, how do you get the data out of there? Um, it, it depends on the platform, but typically it's not too difficult just to pull out photos or something along those lines and then put those up on a review platform. Um, another thing to take into consideration is a lot of platforms will link. So, you know, for instance, the example here is a Facebook post that links to a YouTube video. Do you need, when you're collecting, do you need just evidence of that link or do you actually need to collect the video too? You know, there, there's going to be some additional you know, work that needs to be done. So determine that prior to the collection. And then finally, one of the things that the traditional tools we used to use to collect social media, I'm talking without uh, having the credentials, the different platforms have turned off the API. Again, that's the basically the plug-in to these applications that we can plug tools in and collect everything. So that's become more difficult. There are some specialized tools out there that'll still work. Um, but it has become more difficult. So there's a couple, um, there's two different cases that I actually wanted to talk about in terms of social media, because I think they both kind of address the situation in two different elements. Um, the first one is this emotional distress suit. Um, and this, I think, is a really great example of proportionality in terms of social media. Um, in this particular situation, they basically wanted to enter social media collections um, in as part of the scope of discovery. Um, due to, you know, pricing elements and everything else kind of surrounding that, there was a lot of back and forth in regards to that. And ultimately, the courts held that the defendants could show that the defendant could show up to three pictures of the plaintiff from a social media website if she testified on direct examination regarding the actual emotional state um, during that incident and after the alleged incident in the lawsuit. The plaintiff would then have the opportunity to basically kind of counter that photographic evidence by introducing up to three additional pictures from the same period to kind of rebut that. Um, the main reason why I kind of like to talk about this case is because really ultimately all that's being exchanged or admitted into evidence here is a total of six pictures. Um, you know, kind of going into that amount of information that you can get from a full download on a Facebook download or, you know, some of these other social media sites that allow that. And then having to sift through all of that from a review standpoint and then ultimately producing to opposing counsel. Um, that can cause a lot of attorney hours, a lot of time, a lot of money involved. You know, there's a lot that can be involved in that. So I think it's really great to first and foremost kind of figure out the scope that you can even, um, you know, that you would even be able to kind of enter in, especially for courts. Um, I know that courts kind of are across the board on this situation and there's a lot of back and forth in terms of authentication behind kind of these social media sites and things like that. Um, so I think it is really important to kind of address that with um, whatever jurisdiction you're in and also just kind of with the parties that are involved um, because that can really decrease some of those costs up front that you may just be spending that might not actually come to fruition down the road. Um, so that is kind of a, a good case example, I think, for that.
And then the next case I wanted to talk about is this People versus Valdez case. Um, in this situation, I think this is a great example of authentication. Um, so in this, this was a criminal matter and the police expert witness in this circumstance um, actually brought copies of the defendant's profile from a social media website. In this particular situation, it was Facebook that contained the specific biographical information about the defendant. Um, the argument was that that couldn't be entered into court because there was no way to authenticate that that was actually posted by the individual um, and that really anyone could manipulate that information um, with access to that individual's account. Um, so basically under Rule 901, um, they wanted, in kind of traditional senses, blogs were not considered self-authenticating. Um, there was a lot of precedent that said that, you know, you couldn't bring that in um, just based on the fact that, you know, there was no way to kind of prove that whoever, who was the actual individual that was posting that information and really that could be manipulated by anyone. However, um, in more recent court holdings, they have held that by a reasonable trier of fact, you can conclude that the information posted on the social media profile actually belonged to the defendant just based on the actual login and password information that's required to actually manipulate the information of that biographical, you know, the biographical information that was available to the police expert. So just because I know that Bill kind of discussed that public access versus private access, just because you're entering in public access information does not necessarily mean that that's something that cannot be authenticated in the court, in the eyes of the court. So I think that is really important to know because even if you are, you know, kind of in a situation where you haven't been able to get the full access level that you would like, if there's a limited accessibility that you are still able to get the information that you need, um, you know, there is a lot of case law out there that kind of backs you in the fact that that is something that's still considered admissible under the eyes of the court. So I think this is a great example that kind of talks you through um, how this kind of goes beyond, you know, past situations and blog posts and things that you've kind of entered in online and kind of takes it to another level based on those login and password information um, that's involved with the new social media platforms out there. So um, awesome. any, oh yeah, Deesa, do you wanna yes. kind of question ask yeah. that? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sonali and Phil. This has been so informative. We do have some questions and if you have any more, please submit them. If we do not get to answer them, we will email you and also have possibly an Instagram follow-up uh, after this or next week. So the first question that I do have is how long um, or how much does the remote collection process take? So the, the, short, the short answer is it depends, but I can give some time frames based on the device. So like I'd mentioned before on phones, depends on what you're collecting. If you need to collect off the phone, everything but photos and videos, it's typically about an hour or two. If you need to do a full collection, which we refer to as a method two, typically quote that out at about two to six hours. The factors involved are obviously the size of the phone itself, you know, the, the chip on the phone, how much it can hold, and how much is actually populated on there. If they have a ton of photos and videos, you know, that could take up to the six hours. But more it, it's usually closer to the you know the two hour to three hour range uh pcs again there's factors on that um you know again how big is the hard drive uh what kind of a connection does it have from a usb standpoint is it two or three you know that the, the speed at which data can transfer very significantly there but computers again two, I'd say two to five hours is the range on computers. And things like email, now email, the nice thing about email is it doesn't really impact the user while we're collecting email. Um, but that, you know, that could go anywhere from 10 minutes to 12 hours, depending on how large their mailbox is. Great. And then um, another question is, is there any tool that you recommend for collections um, if, that you often use or 
what do you recommend to achieve the best remote collection? Um, so we do use a variety of uh, tools. The there's not the, the thing that makes things a little difficult is there's not really one tool that does everything well. So we have to use different tools uh, for different circumstances. However, on the phone side of things, the the tool we use is something called Celebrite, which is the industry standard. Um, that does take care of most situations. But on the PC and the email side, there's we probably have an arsenal of 15 plus different software tools we use for collections, depending on the situation. I also think, I just wanted to pepper in, um, I also think it's important to note that even if you have the right tools for the job, um, that final product, cool. when you have to come to terms with the actual review is kind of what sets apart getting a forensic vendor involved versus just utilizing a technology tool um, because even though the tool can be run by everyone that final product is not, not necessarily going to be in the most usable format unless it's kind of thought through um, so that is something to kind of keep in mind especially if you are kind of delving into those like self, self collections that's a I great point Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to agree because I handle the review trainings and I see that most of the hours then are spent recollecting. So approaching it with that forensic collector from the beginning saves so much time from my perspective as well. Go ahead, Phil. I was just going to say, and, and another factor there too, is if you're ever challenged on your collection, if you use a forensic vendor, well, first of all, they can do an affidavit for you and even more so, if you need to put someone on the stand, I think you'd much prefer to have a forensic vendor on there than you know your IT guy who, quite frankly, knows where all the bodies are. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we're going to hit this last question is, what is the liability of the device manufacturer in the collections process? And uh, it's she goes on to elaborate. I remember Apple refusing to back down to the FBI a few years ago. Uh, in cracking on a defendant's iPhone? Sure. So the vast majority of collections that we do, in fact, pretty much all of them, uh, that situation is a non-factor because we're supplied with the pin to the phone. That's important. You do need to get the pin to the phone uh, to do a collection on it. Um, that's a situation that's mainly a law enforcement situation where they get a phone from someone and they refuse to turn over the pin. However, uh, there is, with the iPhone, there is a way to collect where you can bypass that on certain models. You can bypass the security. It takes a lot longer. That process can take up to two to three days. Not always a guarantee you're going to get it, um, but, but it does work at times. But I want to stress, in the vast majority of you know, business litigation and everything, the, you do need to get the PIN number to successfully collect from a phone. Yeah, and I think that kind of applies across the board. I mean, I think it's important to note that a forensic collector is is not a hacker. Um, it's not, you know, they, yeah, don't, go, they don't go. Absolutely. Um, and so I think that it is really important to kind of note that across all of the sources, it's always important to get the accessibility information from whoever is being collected upon. So, um, you know, being as proactive as you can from that end as well is going to help you. Um, to make sure you're getting the right amount of data from the, the appropriate sources. I do have one more question, Sonali, that I think is really good for you. Um, and then we'll we'll conclude. But please submit more questions. If we do not get to them, we will be following up. But this last one is, seems like a lot of this would require cooperation with opposing counsel to agree to an ESI protocol. What can be done when opposing counsel is just an obstructionist and won't agree to a reasonable agreement and just dump stocks on you? Any case law dealing with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, honestly, there's a lot of case law dealing with that. Um, that's something that we kind of see pretty often, and I think it is really important to have an open source of communication um, in terms of what sources are kind of getting involved from that discovery scope. Um, oftentimes, you know, there are opposing counsel where the phone is not something that's going to be on their radar, but maybe it is on your teams. Um, and so, again, kind of going back to the fact that a lot of this information can be very volatile and things can get deleted in the mix of 
you know, the, the case and the course of the litigation. So if that's something that you're, you know, afraid of, um, and you kind of don't have control because they're not your client, then I think it's important to speak up and have full transparency. So you're kind of leaving a full trail that you've done your due diligence. So if something, you know, if there is spoliation aspects down the road or preservation issues, you've kind of already dotted your I's and crossed your T's on your end. Um, so I think that, you know, it's it's always good to kind of cover your tracks in that situation, but also, you know, going beyond that, hoping that they're going to be cooperative and so you're finally ultimately able to get the actual data that you need for your case. So I think, again, having those open sources of communication, but then also that ESI protocol or the production specifications or the discovery order, whatever you want to call it, I think is really important to kind of have fully compiled. Um, how you actually collect your data is going to affect how you're able to produce it. Um, so if there are very strict parameters in place, then you're making sure that there's not as much room for error on both parties and you're kind of both following some sort of streamlined process involved from even the collection status. Um, so I think that's important to kind of understand that kind of being that preemptive approach is going to affect you down the road. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sonali and Phil. This has been super informative. I was taking some great notes. We will be having a follow-up email and this will be accessible on demand. But thank you again, everybody, for joining us for this past hour and be on the lookout for more webinars coming your way. Have a great day. And oh, and one more thing, Phil, do you want to give us a brief overview about Ford Discovery? Sure. For Discovery, we are a boutique digital forensics firm. Uh, we handle everything from collections to forensic investigation to expert reports, all the way to expert testimony. Uh, we work primarily with litigation and data breach scenarios. Awesome. And their information will be included in our follow up email as well. So thank you again, everybody. And as you know, next point is your software for e discovery and projects for all teams of different sizes. So thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you literally quote unquote again soon. <laughs> Stay safe.